wrestling fans its pro wrestle machine with an entry from Dave Meltzer. If you find this informative please consider hitting the subscribe button. August 1, 1988 Wrestling Observer Newsletter, The Murder of Bruiser Brody by Observer Staff. July 16, 1988. In Japan, Shohei Giant Baba, promoter of All Japan Pro Wrestling, was busy making plans for his biggest card in several years. His concept was for the fans to get involved and pick a dream card. The matches involving his top native and foreign stars that received the most votes would take place on August 29 at Tokyo's Budokan Hall. While Baba might not have been able to foresee exactly what matches he would wind up making, he was pretty well sure of what the main event would be. Bruiser Brody vs. Stan Hansen. It would be the first battle of the two most dominant foreign stars of this era in Japan and it would be sure to sell out whatever building it was booked in. On the other side of the world, in Puerto Rico, Carlos Colon, who like Baba, is a nationally famous wrestler and promoter in his native land, was also making plans for his biggest card in recent years. The World Wrestling Council's annual anniversary show was scheduled for September 10, to be held in three separate locations on the island. It would be broadcast on closed-circuit television in the Caribbean and it was also going to be broadcast live in the United States by FNN Score, making it the first international wrestling spectacular from a foreign land ever to be shown in this country. Bruiser Brody was to work the main event. Maybe Colin was thinking of a major angle to hype the card, since business had been down a bit. Perhaps a serious injury would befall Brody and he would come back strong in September, looking for revenge. In Austria Otto Wands, the leading wrestling promoter and recognized world champion in Europe probably still hadn't gotten over his rage. A week earlier, he was scheduled to defend his title against Bruiser Brody in the main event of the biggest wrestling show of the year on the continent. At the last minute, Brody decided to skip the trip because Japanese reporters would be there. A loss to Wands, not considered a major wrestling star by the Japanese, would damage Brody's status in Japan as the toughest man to walk the face of the earth. In several cities in the United States, small independent promoters were working on shows, many of them in small high school gyms or dusty fairgrounds. Some were in towns so small you'd need a magnifying glass to find them on the map. Because virtually all the big-name acts in the U.S. were tied up with the major promotions, the first name on virtually every one of their minds to try and bring in for the main event was Bruiser Brody. That afternoon, Barbara Goodish of Bernie, Texas, a small town 20 miles from San Antonio, got her obligatory phone call from her husband, Frank known to you and me as Bruiser Brody. He was on the third day of a four-day stint in Puerto Rico. There was nothing special to report. Since Brody was kind of like the James Dean of professional wrestling, a rebel both with and without a cause, she had developed almost a sixth sense about when things were going to blow up. Since they often did. But in this case, all was well. The trip was going fine. He'd be home on Monday and they would have almost a month before it was time for another trip to a faraway land. But Monday never came. Early the next morning, Bruiser Brody was pronounced dead on an operating table in San Juan. He was the victim of several stab wounds suffered at the hands of another wrestler in the dressing room the previous night before a card in Biamon Stadium, nine miles outside of San Juan. The last of the wrestling outlaws had been put down for the count. But this was no angle. And there would be no rematch. Bruiser Brody was that rare one-of-a-kind performer. He was an enigma in the wrestling business. He was as much, if not more of a legend in the dressing rooms as he was to millions of wrestling fans on different continents. At 6 foot 5 and 280 pounds, he'd been one of the leading international superstars in the game for the past decade. He was the top foreign attraction in both Japan and Puerto Rico. He was the number one star on the independent market in the United States. He was the wildest man in the game. With his shaggy shoulder-length brown hair, with noticeable traces of gray showing his age and scar-laden forehead, he looked the part as well. He was probably the best brawling style performer pro wrestling ever produced. In a game where super heavyweights often steal the spotlight, he may have been the best all-around worker of the 300-pound types in the history of a business which dates back nearly a century. His style, mannerisms and moves had been copied by dozens of wrestlers, spanning every promotion. Videotapes of his matches in Japan were studying material for prospective wrestlers. He was the prototype for how a big man is supposed to work to get over. Every new super heavyweight that hit Japan over the past few years, whether consciously or not, copied his repertoire in at least some fashion, whether it be his crowd-chasing entrance, his moves, his barking, his chain-swinging, his licking of his hands during a bloody match, even down to his walk. However Brody didn't achieve the fame, at least in the United States, befitting a wrestler with his marketability. At least not in the post-1984 WrestleMania era. He was hard to do business with, was his rep among the major wrestling promoters, he wanted to work on his terms, 
he didn't want to work a taxing full-time schedule with a major office which would threaten to ruin his family life, at least if he could help it. Under virtually no circumstances would he do a job. He was often known to change finishes while in the ring. He was a ruthless businessman, who had seen both sides of the fence while catching on fire as one of the top attractions in the United States a decade ago. While the wrestling wars had given him a lucrative income, part of the price he gave in return was leaving bits of his forehead in arenas throughout the world. Frank Goodish was born on June 14, 1946. He grew up in Warren, Michigan, a lower-class suburb of Detroit. His father was an auto worker by trade, but unemployed a lot. He grew up aggressive and he grew up bigger and faster than most everyone else. His size, toughness and natural athletic ability made him a football and basketball star in high school. He wasn't easily coached, but was tougher than everyone else. In basketball, his size and power allowed him to dominate things underneath. While it allowed him to be effective at the high school level, he knew that he had no future in it. Football was his sport. He went to the University of Iowa in 1964. His contemporaries remember him as one of the best athletes on the team. But he was wild, undisciplined, and going to class wasn't in his repertoire. He wound up at West Texas State University, an outlaw school in Canyon, Texas, near Amarillo which not so coincidentally produced some of the greatest pro wrestlers of this era. Lai was strong on toughness and athletic ability, but weak on football fundamentals. His strengths were enough to get by in small college ball. Next came a fling with pro football. He went to the Washington Redskins under coach Vince Lombardi in 1969, and spent one year on the taxi squad as a 260-pound defensive lineman with a flat top haircut. Although he had the athletic ability to play pro ball, he didn't have either the football skills or the discipline to fit into the team mold. He played a bit with the Edmonton Eskimos in Canada, then bounced around semi-pro teams in Fort Worth and San Antonio, while making his living as a sports writer. His coach in Fort Worth said Goodish was the class of the Texas Football League and couldn't believe someone with his athletic ability didn't make it in the NFL. As a sports writer he was strong on humor but weak on spelling. He also had another problem. His fingers were so big that when he typed, he often hit two keys at once. While playing for the San Antonio Toros in 1973, at the time the best minor league football team in America, and writing for the local paper, he met pro wrestler Ivan Putski while lifting weights. Putski convinced him to take the plunge into wrestling. He started under promoter Leroy McGurk in what later evolved into Bill Watts' Mid-South Territory. Several months later he debuted in Texas for Fritz von Erich, starting out with a fan out of the stands gimmick. His career took off fast. He got his first major break as a headliner in Florida, then considered the best wrestling territory in the country, in late 1975, under the ring name Frank the Hammer Goodish. He won the Florida state title from Rocky Johnson, and headlined for several months in a feud with Billy Robinson. He followed it up with a several-month stint as a main eventer for Vince McMahon Sr.'s Worldwide Wrestling Federation, where he was given the new ring name Bruiser Frank Brody. He was placed in the unenviable position of following up superstar Billy Graham, probably the top heel of the day, and Stan Hansen, who gave Sammartino his famous neck injury, as Sammartino's challenger for the WWF title. However, as a live version of a caveman turned powerlifter, weighing more than 300 pounds, he was tailor-made for the New York market. But when the WWF stay was over, he somehow found it impossible to get work in the United States. He drifted off to New Zealand, where he met his wife. Von Erich brought him back to the United States in late 1977. He was the perfect opponent for Fritz, the promoter and top babyface in the Dallas area. As a willing bleeder, he sold the concept of Fritz Iron Claw to perfection. Lai had already turned into one of the best working big men around, which allowed him to carry Fritz, who was then in his late 40s. Brody was Fritz's leading rival for years, and held the American title on four occasions in Texas. Fritz repaid him by getting him booked in St. Louis and Kansas City, where he was an instant sensation. Then, with his connections with Giant Baba, Fritz set Brody up for his first Japan tour in January of 1979. Brody had already caught fire in the United States in 1978. He was big box office wherever he went, and it was pretty well acknowledged that his size, athletic ability, working ability, gimmick and charisma would get him over big anywhere he was be given even the slightest opportunity. Although Brody's look made him a natural heel, in virtually every city he appeared on any type of a regular basis, he soon was getting cheered heavily by the fans. As was the case of the Road Warrior several years later, the fans basically made it impossible for him to be anything other than a character kick-ass babyface. He drew many sellout crowds, headlined several circuits at once, and was one of the highest paid wrestlers of the time. Before he ever stepped foot in Japan, it was established that he would be a superstar. 
He got a mega push, and his philosophy and popularity in Japan changed the business from a Japanese-dominated game to a game dominated by a few huge Americans. Lai came to the ring screaming and swinging a chain with the instrumental version of Frank Zappa's immigrant song playing in the background. The Japanese photographers followed him everywhere and he always had the chain with him, in restaurants, on the bus, while shopping and he became an immediate cult favorite. His credo with the Japanese was, don't give them nothing and beat them up. Whatever problems that might have caused were more than made up for in increased box office receipts. In the 1970s, most foreign name wrestlers would tour Japan once a year, get put over on TV for a few weeks, then at the end of the tour, do the job for either Baba or his promotional rival Antonio Inoki. But Brody, along with Stan Hansen, changed that. They didn't do the jobs. And they were so powerful and aggressive that they stole the spotlight from the Japanese. But they were so over that they were able to get away with it. He was nicknamed, the Intelligent Monster, in Japan. Brody was a favorite of the Japanese press. He spoke slowly, in English they could understand. He was very quotable and knew many of the writers by name. Some of them considered Brody as much a friend as a star wrestler. His face graced countless magazine covers. There were books and photo albums written on him, comic book drawings of him plus all the regular novelties ranging from t-shirts and posters, all the way to matchbox cards and coffee mugs bearing his likeness. In American promoters' eyes, the stardom in Japan was the worst thing to ever happen to Brody. He was never the easiest wrestler to deal with, but with a guaranteed big money coming from Japan, he wasn't going to be held under the thumb of promoters any longer. He was now dealing from a position of power. He meant box office. He had the ability to get over in a new market faster than anyone else in the business, save perhaps Andre the Giant, who was more of a freak attraction. Before the invasion of the steroid boys he came across, almost undisputedly to the fans, as the biggest, toughest, meanest and roughest man in the business. But when a heel was getting out of hand in a territory, if the promotion called in Brody, the results were wild action and increased houses. Still, at that point, it was by no means the total independent he was later in his career. In 1983, Brody took his first major step in raising the ire of promoters all over the country, after the retirement of Sam Mucknick the legendary promoter in St. Louis, basically acknowledged as being the number one wrestling city in North America the promotion was being run by a conglomerate of folks, among them Vern Gagne, Harley Race, Pat O'Connor, Bob Geigel, and Larry Matuzic. Matuzic broke away from the NWA, used Brody as his main attraction, and for a short while actually outdrew the NWA group. But with Brody as important as he was in Japan, especially with Baba in second place in a bitter promotional war, blacklisting him wasn't possible anymore. And after Matuzic's group failed and Vince McMahon Jr. began his expansion, Brody's value to the NWA increased to the point that whatever grudges were held were forgotten in quest of big gates and holding off McMahon. In the pre-McMahon era, Japan was the spot for big money. Baba and Inoki had a rivalry, which on occasion, exploded into all-out war. Even with Stan Hansen and Brody vs. the Funk Brothers feud as its main attraction, Baba was trailing Inoki who had caught fire like no promotion ever had during this decade, drawing sellouts six or seven nights per week with himself, the original Tiger Mask, Ricky Choshu, Dynamite Kid, Hulk Hogan and Abdullah the Butcher as his leading attractions. A scandal on Inoki's side in 1983, stemming from the retirement of the original Tiger Mask, combined with Terry Funk's retirement hysteria, closed the gap somewhat. Baba took the lead late in 1984 when he signed Choshu and his entire army away from Inoki. Inoki was made even more desperate when McMahon held him up for $500,000 annually to book WWF wrestlers, who had toured Japan for Inoki for more than a decade for a $50,000 annual booking fee. When Inoki decided in 1985 not to renew his agreement with Titan Sports, he was giving up his leading foreign draw Hogan, coming on the heels of Dynamite Kid following Cho Shu's lead and joining Baba. Inoki was desperate for talent and looking for revenge on Baba as well. A contact was made with Brody. On March 9, 1985, Baba promoted a huge show headlined by the Road Warriors' Tokyo debut. Because the Warriors were new and had a unique gimmick, they immediately surpassed Brody and Hansen as the top foreign attractions, and their $10,000 weekly pay on their first tour equaled Brody's status after more than six years of being a top draw. On the live television card, Brody would have his first TV meeting against Choshu in a tag team match. The match got totally out of control, with Choshu nearly getting knocked out at one point from a stiff kick, and Brody was completely uncooperative in allowing Choshu any advantage. Three nights later, in the middle of a six-man tag match, Brody suddenly took his chain and walked out of the building. He had just signed a contract with Inoki. It was the most lucrative deal ever signed by a pro wrestler up to that point. For 16 weeks per year in Japan, Brody would earn $14,000 a week in 1985, 
$16,000 in 1986 and $18,000 in 1987. He also received a six-figure signing bonus. At the same time, the biggest thing to hit U.S. wrestling was in the planning stages Vince McMahon's first WrestleMania at Madison Square Garden, featuring actor Mr. T in the main event. McMahon's enemies were livid at his nationwide expansion into their territories. It was widely assumed McMahon was on the edge financially and that this was his do or die. Lone promoter actually discussed with Brody the wildest, toughest and craziest bird in the nest, the idea of going to Madison Square Garden and jumping Mr. T as he came down the aisle, ensuring that McMahon's show would be a flop. Figuring the resulting lawsuits that would follow, Brody didn't seriously consider the request. Almost from the start with Inoki, Brody questioned whether the money was worth the aggravation, and in the long run decided that leaving Baba was the biggest mistake of his wrestling career. Baba's tours were far more organized and easier mentally. Inoki's tours were stressful, with constant pressure on him to do the job for Inoki. While Brody's matches with Inoki drew sellout gates in the big buildings early including one house of $465,000, in the pre-dollar devaluation days, in Nagoya the promotion matched them up so frequently that by the end of the year, the feud had cooled off because neither would do the job. The pressure was increasing on Brody, who hadn't done a job since early 1981. At the same time with Inoki in need of new foreign talent, Brody acted as the intermediary in wooing Von Eric from his longtime association with Baba, across to Inoki, for which he was promised a sizable finder's fee by Inoki. Brody hadn't gotten his finder's fee when he and Jimmy Snuka left for Japan in November for the annual tag team tournament. Brody was unhappy before he ever went to Japan, and it exploded the day before the tournament was to end. Brody had a singles match against Seiji Sakaguchi, a former Japanese national champion in judo, who had 6 foot 5 and 280 pounds, matched up to him in size and both were about the same age. The match got out of hand, although reports differ on who started it. In any event, Brody finished it, by using his chain on Sakaguchi's knee. On the train the next day, heading for the tournament finals, and with Brody and Snuka in the championship match, a message was passed to Brody from Sakaguchi, who was also the booker for New Japan. Whatever the message said, it was enough to infuriate Brody. He and Snuka got off the train at the next stop, then headed back to their hotel. It should be noted that in Japan, the wrestlers aren't paid until the completion of the tour, so Brody walked out on more than $40,000, and Snuka walked out on a big payday as well to show his loyalty to Brody. While the Japanese forgave Snuka, believing Brody to be the catalyst, presumably this was the end of Brody's Japanese wrestling career. Things were changing in the United States as well. McMahon had set the U.S. scene on fire, and Jim Crockett was trying to follow in his wake. Their expansions were destroying the smaller groups, who also seemed self-destructive at times by their own actions. Brody was called upon by several of the smaller groups as a quick fix, and even though the younger muscle men had taken away his toughest man in the game image with some fans, he still remained with a strong cult following. There were at least a few occasions when McMahon and Brody negotiated. Apparently negotiations never got too serious. McMahon certainly knew the money Brody would draw against Hulk Hogan, but perhaps was wary of having Brody, whose reputation was of being something less than a good soldier in his dressing rooms. Brody was certainly aware of the potential income and exposure from being a major star with Titan, but wasn't willing to sacrifice his independence nor give up time with his wife and son Jeffrey, that Titan's horrendous travel schedule would require. If all things had gone as expected, Brody someday probably would have worked for McMahon. With the independent promotions drying up in the US, and with the wrestling style in Japan so physically taxing, there eventually would have come a day when Brody's body would have given out. Even though he was addicted to training, the constant pounding of wrestling, combined with his age, somewhere down the line would have taken its toll. Probably a few years down the line when he recognized the end was a year or two away, he'd join McMahon for one last big run, and probably in some general fans' eyes would have become the early 19,900 e imitation of Hacksaw Jim Duggan. Ironically, Inoki and Brody got back together during the summer of 1986, when both were booked on a card in Honolulu. Brody returned for two matches in Japan in September, drawing two sellouts and agreed to return for the tag team tournament for a major increase in weekly pay, probably of more than $20,000 per week. But Inoki's business was in so much turmoil, this new record deal never got off the ground. Inoki himself probably recognized that Brody was worth the money, at least to him personally. Brody brought out the best in Inoki, and Inoki was able to regain a great deal of popularity because his matches with Brody were so exciting. Sakaguchi probably didn't think much of the deal since he and Brody never really made amends from their earlier troubles. Akira Maeda was gaining his own tough guy image and matches with Brody would have also sold out. Although the problem of those two getting out of control, probably out of dual paranoia as much as anything else, was possible. 
A money squabble ensued before the tour and Brody and New Japan had their final blow-up. Brody landed on his feet, winding up as booker in world class for a few months. He was in hot demand as an independent when suddenly that market reopened after the success of WrestleMania 3 spawned an increased interest among armchair and would-be promoters. He wrestled for a while under a mask as Red River Jack. He even did his first job in more than six years for a Villa the Butcher, unexpected, one night in Fort Worth. By October, Baba wanted him back in Japan after Ric Flair cancelled a tour at the last minute. By the end of the December Tag Team Tournament, in which he and Snuka lost in the finals to Jumbo Tsurida and Yoshiaki Yatsu, he was voted as the most popular foreign wrestler in Japan, by a wide margin, surpassing all the Road Warriors, Bam Bam Bigelows and Hulk Hogan's who had followed in his footsteps. Deaths in wrestling, unfortunately, have become almost commonplace the past few years. Tragedy has haunted the business. Some of it is partially caused by the business itself. Others are just cruel twists of fate. Several sports have had drug deaths, although wrestling has had more than its share. The travel schedule and constant driving, particularly late at night driving, increases the risk of auto accidents. But even so, the number of serious accidents involving wrestlers in recent years has been more than a slightly alarming proportion. Some things are just bad luck. Mad Dog Vashon was in the wrong place at the wrong time. The business had nothing to do with it. From all accounts, it seems ridiculous to blame anything but bad luck for the recent deaths of Adrian Adonis, the Canadian Wildman, and Pat Kelly. It's probably not fair to blame the business for this most recent tragedy, either. Ironically, Brody was there for more than a few of these tragedies. He was in Japan in 1984 when David Von Erich died. One of the most memorable news clips in the history of wrestling was on Japanese television, at Von Erich's Japanese funeral. Brody, with tears streaming down his scarred-up face, looked down and kissed Von Erich as he laid in the casket. He was the booker for world class when Mike Von Erich committed suicide, and in truth, had a premonition just a week or two beforehand that this would happen. He was also in Texas when Gino Hernandez passed away, and was on tour of Japan when Haru Sonoda went down in a plane crash. Bruiser Brody debuted in Puerto Rico as a heel in 1983. Those who were there at the time recall that he got over like a million bucks by the end of his first weekend. Tom Renisto was the booker and there were plenty of problems over finishes. Brody did what he wanted, not what he was told, but was able to get away with it because what he wanted seemed to always work. After a while Renisto didn't even bother to give him finishes and just told him to do whatever he wanted. At one point, several years back, Brody was somewhat concerned while on a tour when they put Joe Frazier in the ring as referee for on his matches with Colin. Brody had caused a lot of promoters a lot of problems and he was concerned that perhaps, this would be the revenge. But it wasn't, of course. Although Brody was never a perfect angel and on occasion did question finishes, it never appeared he had any major problems in Puerto Rico, at least not on the level as those in the US and Japan. Brody had been a leading heel in Puerto Rico since his debut but maybe a year or so back, he turned babyface by saving Invader No. 1, whose real name was Jose Huertas Gonzalez, from a double-team attack by Jason the Terrible and Abdullah the Butcher. The two had been occasional tag-team partners over the past year. While it is true that several months back, Brody and Colin had a pretty heated shouting match in the dressing room because Brody treated Colin's world tag champs, Kendo Nagasaki and Mr. Pogo, like jobbers, giving them nothing, since Japanese photographers were at ringside. He had gone back a few times afterwards with no problems. He even offered to lose via countout to Dory Funk Jr. in the Gillette Cup this past spring. Brody arrived in San Juan on July 14 for the final wrestling tour of his life. The first night of the tour, he even rode to the town with two of Colin's partners in Capital Sports, Gonzalez, the booker, and Victor Quinones, who worked the box office. Quinones was Brody's best friend in Puerto Rico and all three were amicable and joked about things, talked about Vince McMahon, and whatever else came up. A tremendous amount of rumors and varying stories have been told about the final day or two of Brody's life. Brody was one of the most streetwise wrestlers around, and generally knew when trouble was coming before it ever got there. If anything, he sometimes sniffed trouble when there wasn't any. Brody was in a lot of fights during his wrestling career, and nobody can ever recall him getting whipped, mainly because he was never caught unaware, and more often than not, through the first punch. I've heard what seems like 100 different versions of what happened on July 16th. We've gotten reports from police, witnesses, compared notes with others investigating the death and heard second-hand information from just about everyone who talked with anyone that was in Puerto Rico that night. In my own mind, this is what I believe to be as close to an accurate account of what happened as we are going to get. If there was any trouble brewing that day, Brody didn't have a scent of it. He was in a good mood during the afternoon from all accounts. 
he rode with wrestlers Dutch Mantel and Tony Atlas to Biomon Stadium for the big outdoor show of the weekend. He was scheduled third from the top, against Danny Spivey, just underneath a tag team cage match with the Invaders, Gonzalez and Roberto Soto, against Ron and Chicky Star, and Colin defending the Universal title against Abdullah the Butcher. Business was a little slow with maybe 8,000 fans in attendance, so there was probably some disappointment among those in the promotion. Brody arrived in the locker room with his two cohorts at about 7.15 p.m. for a show which was scheduled to begin at 8.30. Most of the babyfaces had already arrived, including Puerto Rican stars like Colin Gonzalez and Victor Jovica, all part owners of the promotion. Also there was TNT Miguelito Perez, Hurricane Castillo Jr. and Mark and Chris Youngblood. Gonzalez was apparently sitting on a bench with a large towel around his right hand. About five minutes later he asked Brody to come into the bathroom for a private meeting, apparently saying, Brody mi amigo, come here por favor, which translated means, Brody, my friend, come here as soon as possible. This isn't the slightest bit unusual procedure in wrestling circles, as that's where most private meetings take place. Brody went in as one witness said, like a lamb being led to slaughter. About five seconds after the door closed, the babyfaces all heard a loud scream and rushed to the bathroom. The bathroom wall was made of plexiglass and was transparent. One of the wrestlers happened to be looking in that direction and claimed to have seen the actual stabbing. When the wrestlers opened the door, Brody was holding his guts and blood was spurting everywhere. He was dragged out of the bathroom and panic ensued. Gonzalez left the building. The ring doctor was called to the dressing room. Brody was fully conscious at this point. His blood pressure was normal however there were air bubbles in his blood, as one of the stab wounds severed the arteries that bring blood to the heart. Another wound, which turned out to be the fatal one, punctured his life. His lung was also pierced, possibly from a third wound, possibly by one of the other two. Brody was talking very softly with Colin as he laid on the ground of the dressing room, telling Carlos, no matter what happens, please, take care of my boy. An ambulance was called for during the commotion and arrived at approximately 7.45 p.m. Atlas left with Brody to a hospital in San Juan. When the doctors wouldn't allow Atlas to stay in Brody's hospital room, he returned to Bayamon Stadium and wrestled his match. The card went on as scheduled. The fans, of course, were not informed as to what happened. Gonzalez returned to the building, wearing a new shirt, and wrestled his scheduled match. It's not clear exactly what the heels were told happened to Brody, if anything. Supposedly many didn't find out anything until they returned to the hotel that night. Although the promotion knew Brody was in serious condition, they believed he had stabilized. Most seemed satisfied that the promotion didn't realize just how serious Brody's condition was. Barbara Goodish was awoken late Saturday night by a phone call. Her first instinct was not to answer, since that was her rule on post-midnight phone calls when Frank was on the road. However, she broke the rule and was told a terrible accident had taken place and she should head to Puerto Rico immediately. The call, apparently, was from Colin's wife. She thought it was a prank, or maybe hoped it was a prank, and called the hotel, asking for Brody. The clerk at the hotel desk already knew the story, and instead patched her into a room with another wrestler, who told her things were pretty rough and Frank might be in the hospital for a while. But the wrestler apparently didn't know, and Barbara had no idea, that this was a life or death situation. She packed up some things, woke up Jeffrey, and they headed to Puerto Rico. They were met in the airport by Abdullah the Butcher, who gave her the bad news. Her husband had died on the operating table in the hospital at approximately 4.30 a.m. Sunday night, Capital Sports had a card scheduled for Mayaguez. Word hadn't leaked yet to the public about what happened the previous night, and a sellout crowd was there. Several of the American wrestlers had heard the news and didn't show up for the card. A few left the island almost immediately. Several of the babyfaces went to the police station to give their statements. Some of the American heels hadn't heard the news and went to Mayaguez. Colin was there. So was Gonzalez, ready to work again. Colin asked the wrestlers to work the show, supposedly saying that Frank would have wanted it that way. Enough of the wrestlers walked out and the card was cancelled. Gonzalez was arrested on Monday on charges of first-degree murder and a weapons violation. The alleged murder weapon and knife was never recovered by the police, as it had disappeared from the scene of the crime. Gonzalez was held on $120,000 bond, and was later released after posting $12,000. He is scheduled for arraignment on August 8. Puerto Rico doesn't have a death penalty. The maximum sentence for conviction would be 99 years in prison. Besides being the booker, and part owner of the company, Gonzalez had been a wrestler for about 19 years. He wrestled under the name Cebu Singh on the West Coast, and later Manuel Cruz. He was a preliminary wrestler in the early 1970s for the WWWF under his real name. In 1976, 
he went to Puerto Rico under the hood as the masked invader, and was a main eventer shortly thereafter. He also worked in the WWF under the mask, with Johnny Rivera as the invaders, around 1983-84, before returning to his native land. Some recall him being a hothead, and other wrestlers claim he wasn't well-liked, although the position of Booker generally leads to resentment, among the boys. There are several rumors and theories trying to answer the question as to why it happened. The main story is that Brody was killed because he either refused to do a job for Spivey on Saturday night, or was supposed to do a job for Spivey the previous night in a tag team match and didn't do it. The police themselves did say that Invader asked Brody to lose a match and Brody said no. But that hardly qualifies A as a motive for murder. The wrestlers on the babyface side discount that story. There simply wasn't enough time between when Brody got into the bathroom and they heard the scream, just a few seconds, for there to be any discussion of a finish or an argument about a finish. If that had been discussed earlier in the day, Brody would not have been in a good mood because he knew in advance there was going to be trouble because they wanted a finish he wasn't going to give. The story that was reported in several newspapers that they were arguing over money holds no weight either. Wrestlers who appear in Puerto Rico receive a check in the mail three weeks later so they don't have to carry large amounts of cash across the border. While I don't know what Brody's deal was for this tour, whatever the deal had been, was worked out well in advance. Another theory is that Brody owned a percentage of the company, and they wanted it back, but that is simply untrue. While some of the heels claim there had been problems between Brody and Gonzalez over finishes over the past year, nobody can recall any problems on this tour. If there had been any serious problems, Brody wouldn't have been caught so unaware. While I don't completely discount the story that it was over a job, and at least one witness must have told police that, it may be simply an unexplained case of a guy snapping because of jealousy or built-up hatred that nobody knows about. Other wrestlers recall that Gonzalez was always paranoid about his position as a babyface, and Brody was competition for that spot. I don't buy any kind of conspiracy theory, for reasons I'd rather not get into here. It is true that in several ways the promotion didn't handle the aftermath properly, particularly in allowing Gonzalez to wrestle that night and presumably would have allowed him to wrestle the next night had the other wrestlers not walked out. There is also the rumor that Gonzalez was off balance because his daughter had drowned earlier that week, but in reality, that accident happened more than six months ago. Brody's funeral was held on Tuesday. Several hundred fans in Puerto Rico attended along with wrestlers and a truckload of photographers and reporters from Japan. His body was cremated, as per his request. Barbara and Jeffrey Goodish watched the proceedings, trying his best to maintain their composure. Apparently during the service, Jeffrey told his mother, I'm not going to embarrass Daddy by crying at his funeral. Colin's promotion had a card the next night. There was a huge banner on the building wall in Spanish. The English translation of what was on the banner was, We the wrestling fans of Puerto Rico wish to extend our deepest sympathies to the family and friends of Bruiser Brody. Please don't judge the people of Puerto Rico by the actions of one madman. The banner had several thousand signatures. The death of Bruiser Brody made major news headlines in both Japan and Puerto Rico, and also received a lot of coverage in Texas, particularly in Fort Worth, where the newspaper had articles daily this past week, some of them on the front page of the newspaper. In many other newspapers, it received a line or two, maybe a few paragraphs, from early wire service reports. It was widely reported in several Spanish-language newspapers in the United States. It even made the news in such exotic locations as Australia, New Zealand and even Thailand. But in most of the United States, it largely went unreported. After all, this is still professional wrestling. And being that it is professional wrestling, the public reaction from the wrestling community was predictable. Neither the NWA nor the WWF acknowledged anything. It wasn't surprising, since the WWF never even acknowledged the passing of Adrian Adonis either, who was a major star for them, while Brody had never even worked for the group in the new era. Both the major groups have a policy of being oblivious to anything that happens outside of their promotion. In the case of the NWA, they should have broken that rule since the TBS Saturday show is the most up-to-date national show on television. The world-class promotion mentioned the death, and have plans of giving away Brody memorabilia at upcoming cards. Joe Pettuccino's Pro Wrestling This Week syndicated show will be devoting a 30-minute special on the career of Brody, scheduled for a July 30th air date. Entertainment Tonight is scheduled to do a piece on both Brody and Adrian Adonis sometime this coming week. Jerry Blackwell's Southern Championship Wrestling, which Brody worked quite a bit for, and which Blackwell and Booker Buck Robley were two of Brody's best friends in the business, is scheduled to air a one-hour special on Brody within the next few weeks as well. With or without Brody, the independent business in this country is hanging on by a thread, threatened with extinction due to McMahon's expansion to four shows per night. But the independent's greatest weapon for survival is no longer. 
Giant Baba himself may be faced with his greatest challenge yet trying to combat the threat of the Universal Wrestling Federation without his biggest drawing card. And Puerto Rico has to rebuild a business that has been devastated by a tragedy the likes of which this business has never seen before. Officially, the promotion has told the wrestlers that Gonzalez is no longer a part of the company. All but a few of the American wrestlers have left Puerto Rico, and the promotion, hoping somehow to regain the confidence of the Americans, is trying desperately to get some talent back. They also have to begin what may be a slow process in regaining the confidence of their fans as well. Already they've been forced to tone down their anniversary show. There will be no broadcast in the United States. There will be no three-city live sites. There will be no closed-circuit broadcast. The show will go on as planned, however, in Roberto Clemente Stadium. December 13, 1981. It was time for the finals of Giant Baba's annual tag team tournament. Bruiser Brody and Jimmy Snuka were facing off against the Funk Brothers. The match started out slow but built up to the point that it is generally regarded as one of the greatest matches in the history of the Orient. Certainly it was among the most memorable. All four men were at their best here and when the dust settled, Stan Hansen had shocked the crowd by showing up at ringside, he had just a few days earlier finished a tour with Inoki, and this arrival signaled his jump to Baba. Brody pinned Dory after a knee drop to win the tournament. For the next three years, Brody and Hansen repeated the same scene not always winning, but always getting into the finals of the tournament, and on the final night having classic matches that fans will never forget. And that's the bottom line. Whether you saw him before 200 fans at an independent show, where he made the building look like a tornado had just hit when he was finished, or at a major arena before a sellout crowd, Brody was one of those rare wrestling personalities that fans will never forget. I'll just touch on a few headlines before closing out this issue. The Baltimore Bash drew somewhere between 350,000 and 400,000 homes on pay-per-view nationwide, 35 to 4% buy rate, which makes the gross somewhere between $5.50 and $6 million, which is roughly what was expected. All three companies which carried the show within 48 hours, all agreed to carry Crockett's next pay-per-view show, scheduled for December, which again means they'll have at least 10 million addressable homes cleared, and pretty much ensure some success. Outside of three Vince McMahon shows, WrestleMania 3 and 4 and the Survivor Series and a few boxing matches, this was the highest grossing event in the industry's history. Most events like boxing matches, non-media glamour events, or concerts that go on pay-per-view nationally do a national 1% buy rate and 2% is considered exceptional although in reality, the show did no more, and no less, than was expected. The buy rate varied greatly depending upon the area of the country, also as expected. It did exceptional in the Carolinas, and throughout the Southeast, where it actually beat out the numbers of WrestleMania 4. It did threes in much of the rest of the country, but did poorly in Los Angeles, November 2nd, and not so well in New York, 2.2, which are the key media markets. Jack Petrick of TBS was quoted in a Tokyo newspaper called Yoshitake saying that he will have jurisdiction over the new NWA after the buyout. He said TBS would set policy, he would enforce it, and the wrestling end of the business would be left in control of Jim Crockett and Dusty Rhodes. Petrick said the sale would be finalized within 60 days. This is the first published report from the PBS side confirming the long-standing rumor and news reports that have been printed that the NWA is in the process of selling the promotion to TBS. Jerry Lawler beat Kerry Von Erich via due on July.18 in Memphis in their unification match when Von Erich used a pile driver, which is illegal in Memphis, apparently unaware of its illegality. The world-class title is supposed to change hands via DQ, but I guess somebody forgot that stipulation when agreeing to the finish. Rematches are set for July.25 in Memphis, set for no due and there must be a winner, how are they going to get out of this? And another on July.30 in Tampa as part of Florida Championship Wrestling's Eddie Graham Memorial Card. Shane Douglas and Lord Humongous won the CWF tag team titles from Sergeant Carter and Private Pyle, who subbed for Detroit Demolition who faked an injury, on July.18 in Birmingham. Lots of other hot stuff happened at that taping that I'll get into next week. CWF returns to FNN slash score on August 4th at 9 p.m. Eastern with a highlight show, catching all of us up on all the angles we've missed while FNN had preempted the show. On August 14th it will return to a weekly Sunday night slot at 8 p.m. Eastern. CWA will move back to Saturdays. In the future, when preemptions occur, it will be the CWA, and not CWF, that will lose the slot. Vern Gagné is planning a national pay-per-view show called WrestleRock 3 on Sunday, November 6th from the Metrodome, 55,000 seats in Bloomington, Minnesota's ZZ Top will perform in concert. Originally this show was slated for election night, that's right, head-to-head -head with what could be a close presidential election, 
but they moved it up two days. Supposedly talent from five promotions will appear on the card although the only match I know of is Magnificent Mimi against Medusa Makalai. On a July.4 Knoxville show where Doug Furness won the USA title, the guy he beat in the finals of the tournament was Bill Dundee. Dave Peterson is coming to Titan and Kurt Hennig is negotiating, although Hennig is somewhat in the doghouse after twice turning down Titan after agreeing to terms earlier. Tommy Gilbert will be the booker when Bob Geigel starts up his own promotion in the Central. States once again. Relations between Geigel and World Class were severed because travel expenses were putting all the shows into red ink. Starting date is July.24 with Gilbert, Mike George, once again billed as WWA World Champion, Vince Apollo, Solomon Grundy, Billy Travis and Mike Stone working for this new group. Kerry Brown was fired by Stampede Wrestling. Makan Singh is now defending his North American title against Steve Blackman on the top of the cards. Blackman isn't bad, given his level of experience, but isn't capable of having good matches yet, either and is not ready for this kind of a push. Owen Hart will return to Titan once he recovers from a knee sprain. The NWA drew a $167,800 gate on July.23 in Philadelphia going head-to-head with the WWF, which had Savage vs. DBS on top. The NWA headlined with a War Games. I've heard conflicting reports on how the WWF did, one source saying 6,100 fans and $77,000, and another saying 9,115 fans and $116,035, although several in attendance swear to me there weren't anywhere near 9,000 fans there although my most reliable source swears there was. Hercules Hernandez needed 76 stitches in his arm to close the cut he received falling on the table in Redding, California a few weeks back. Hernandez and the anabolic warrior got into trouble that night because they were knocking TV monitors over left and right as they brawled outside the ring. Missy Hyatt has been in Tom Pritchard's corner, as a babyface, feuding with Tony Anthony and his valet mystic, in several continental cities after a mix-up on dates occurred with Bambi, who was originally slated for the poll. Dick Slater quit Jerry Blackwell's group to work in Puerto Rico, which apparently has some people upset since Brody had a lot of friends in this business, he had a lot of enemies as well, and some won an informal U.S. wrestler boycott of the WWC. Hector Guerrero and Ricky Santana are now working for Global Wrestling in Florida. Joe Malenko won a one-match tournament for the Global Junior Heavyweight title on July.23 in Pompano Beach beating Guerrero via DQ when Rusty Brooks interfered. Soul Man Alex G and Johnny Evans, the Soul Patrol, won the global tag team titles from Brooks and Jumbo Beretta at the same TV taping. Dean Malenko is no longer wrestling as he's taken a job in Tennessee working the counter for one of the airlines. Jerry Lawler, Kurt Hennig, Bob Orton and Bam Bam Bigelow will all be coming in for the CWF title tournament, however the August 22nd date has been scrapped due to a building conflict with Boutwell Auditorium in Birmingham. We'll have the new date here next week, but it will be either the last week of August or the first week of September. Bigelow is heading back to Japan shortly for Inoki. Andre and Duggan drew a near sellout of 10,000 on July.23 in Nashville. Brother Ernest Angel has disappeared from wrestling without a trace. Bill Dundee will be headed back to the CWA, while Jimmy Valiant is apparently leaving after the July.25 card in Memphis. Brickhouse Brown, now wearing a cowboy hat and being called Bunkhouse Brown, is about to be turned babyface and feud with Robert Fuller, as Fuller has been doing some racial remarks on the tube. Fuller does a good job as an obnoxious heel, however the TV shows have turned into the Fuller show, he does four or five interviews per show, so he's crossed the line of overexposure. The only problem is, Memphis talent is so thin, they've really got nobody else to pick up the slack. Watlin Atlanta is dropping its famous Saturday night wrestling block. The station is having second thoughts about its image in the city as the wrestling station. Joe Pettuccino is negotiating with other stations in the market to take his act, consensus on the NWA bashes is that virtually every city, if the War Games is on, it's about the best live match you'll ever see, and the Midnight Fantastics never disappoint, but everything else is snooze city.